Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Today's Thursday, January 28th, 2021. In today's podcast, I'm joined by Rifki Chudnoff to talk about pelvic health and pelvic therapy. Rifki is a physical therapist with a specialty in pelvic therapy. This is a rapidly growing field in gynecology as we learn how many women will benefit from physical therapy of their pelvic floor muscles. It can be useful for incontinence, prolapse, and pain, as well as other gynecologic or pelvic symptoms. Rifki is a great clinician and also a wonderful person. She's very positive, reassuring, and easy to talk to. You're going to enjoy listening to her. As an aside, I've known Rifki since we were little kids. As we grew up together and went to school together in Chicago, back when we called her Rifki Rosenzweig. Shout out to Rifki's mom, Mrs. Rosenzweig, who is my seventh grade teacher. If you're listening, I hope you're proud of Rifki, but also proud that I remember everything you taught us about Animal Farm and Chernowitz. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I am your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. All right, we're here with Rifki Chudnoff, aka Rifki Rosenzweig from Peterson Park in Chicago. Rifki, welcome hey. to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Hey, Nady. This is amazing. We just spent like the last like half hour catching up before the podcast because uh, Rifki and I grew up together in Chicago. Go Aces. <laughs> Go Aces. Yeah, Rifki's, I mean, listen, Rifki's mom was my teacher in seventh grade and Rifki's dad and I played basketball together. And yeah, I mean, I've known you since what? We're like five years old, plus yeah, minus? Something like that. Something like that. Unbelievable. Good times. And Rifki, you are now a, uh, a physical therapist working in Bogota, New Jersey at Hamakom Physical Therapy. And you are also doing a lot of pelvic floor therapy, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's what I specialize in. Fantastic. So let's let's jump right in. Tell us a little bit about your backgrounds. Everyone knows, you know, now that you're from Peterson Park in Chicago and that you have a wonderful family and I've known you a long time. But tell us your story. How'd you get into physical therapy? How'd you get into pelvic floor therapy? Open-ended question. Go anywhere you want with this. I um, went into physical therapy. I always worked with kids with disabilities in high school and then through college. And I really wanted to work with that population. And I'm just trying to figure out how to, what, at what point to help them with. And I became a physical therapist with intentions of working with kids with disabilities, which I did. And um, I married my husband, who was an OBGYN resident. Two months into his residency, we got married. <laughs> Real smart. And yeah, by the way. <laughs> Let's marry someone, someone I'm never going to see for the next four years. Let Actually, me tell you something. It, it makes for a good marriage, probably. <laughs> That's, it was, it was, I wouldn't have done it that way again. I mean, I would have married him still, just we, the timing wasn't great. It's like marrying, but, um, so, it's like marrying someone before they're like deployed to Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. It's not so different. Not so different. He came home covered in blood most nights. <laughs> it was actually, I was work, happily working with kids with disabilities, enjoying my job. And uh, my husband, Scott, said to me, he's like, you know, tell, started telling me about pelvic health physical therapy, which is a relatively new specialty in physical therapy. When I went to PT school um, in what my kids like to call the 1900s, <laughs> Do your kids do that? My, in the kid, 1900s, my kids, yeah, my kids think I lived in black and white. Yes, mine too. <laughs> Why did they ask me that? Actually, when we I went to physical therapy school, um, they didn't even tell, teach us really about pelvic health physical therapy because it was such an emerging field, and I had really never even heard about it. So um, Scott, you know, started telling me about it, and. I said, oh, that sounds weird. I'll tell you what, you, you work with the vaginas and I'll stay with the kids. <laughs> and that's literally what I said to him. Then we went to a conference. I joined him at a conference where he was presenting and I met a woman named Tali Rosenbaum, who today is a sex therapist, but at the time was a pelvic health physical therapist. And she started telling me about what she did and what her, what kind of pa patients she did, saw and how she helped people. And I was just blown away. I was like, that sounds unbelievable. My husband pretty much won't let me live there down. He's like, I told you, you should go into this. You had to hear from somebody else, but pretty much that's what happened. And it required a lot of retraining, um, more training to specialize in this field. And also at this point, I had had a couple of kids of my own. And so uh, my understanding of the function and dysfunction of the pelvic floor <laughs> became clearer to me. And I retrained and spent a lot of time, shout out to my mother-in-law, watched my kids like, go to courses and went into specialty. And at one point I was doing both pediatrics 
early intervention, not pelvic floor, and doing pelvic floor physical therapy. And over the last, uh, I would say, 10, 15 years, it's really just been pelvic health physical therapy, although I do do work with some pediatric patients with pelvic health, and that's probably for a different podcast. But that's really what I've the focus of my career has really been helping women with um, pelvic health issues, also postpartum and postpartum and um, pregnancy related issue and pretty much anything that has to do with pelvic regen um, or women's health issues related. Wow. So I, I want to go into what you're saying about the training a little bit more. So when you when you go to get trained in physical therapy, uh, and if it's different now from what it was back in the 1900s, uh, <laughs> when you and I trained, you can definitely point it out. So what does it entail in general? So not related to pelvic you know, health. What What is the training to become a physical therapist? Right. So it, it used to be a bachelor's degree before our time, even older than us. And then it became a master's degree. So I had a bachelor's degree in actually, you could probably have it in anything. You just have to do prerequisites. I had a bachelor's in biology and I applied to graduate school and got a master's. I have an MSPT, a master's in physical therapy. So it was a three-year program after college. Actually, I went to Rutgers. It used to be called University of Medicine and Dentistry. People are like, are you a dentist? I'm like, no, <laughs> but now it's Rutgers. So that makes life much simpler. And it was three years combination of, you know, rotations kind of like in medical school where you rotate through doing, you know, pretend like you're a real doctor, pretend like you're a real physical therapist to patients who don't know the difference between you and somebody else in a white lab coat and also taking courses. And you get trained in all different areas of physical therapy. You learn about cardiopulmonary, you learn orthopedic, you learn neurology, you learn pediatrics, you learn to work with all those different types of populations. So, and usually the first couple of jobs you have really help you determine what field you would be interested in going into and help you really learn really is, you know, probably also as you really learn most of what you know on the job right. and actually seeing patients, not in the textbooks. Right. So that's, you know, that's really how that works in terms of physical therapy as well. Today, they moved to, of course, a couple of years after I graduated, they moved to doctorate programs. Yeah, it's, it's much more like intense now. It's it's so long to finish physical therapy training currently. Is it long? I don't know. If it, is it longer? I think just, it's longer. I think there's extra years because you have to get, you get a, a doctorate, I guess, a DPT. PhD. Or something, yeah. yeah it's that's like, it's a DP, it's a DPT, it's a doctor of physical therapy. Yeah. And so, do do the training programs now include pelvic health, or do they still, or they still don't, as far as you know? Yeah, they know they do. Um, they don't train them to the degree degree that you could graduate and go work in pelvic health. I don't know all the programs, but the ones that I've you know worked with students with, you know. They, they graduate with like an understanding of what the field entails, you know, what kind of patients, you know, a general, I would say you get a general overview, maybe an elective at best. I can't speak to every program in the country, but for a hundred percent, like of you need to be taking extra continuing education courses to be able to work in the field. If, if somebody's interested in going to public health, they absolutely need to take, a, you know, several continuing education courses to be able to help people with pelvic floor issues. And so what exactly would those be? Like what kind of continuing education courses did you take or what would someone have to take nowadays? Yeah. So there are different levels of courses. So there's, and then there's like, you know, extra specialized courses. So you take like a level, what they call like level one, two, two A, two B, three, depending on which organization you take it through. Each level is specialized and usually I, I actually teach um, physical therapists now who want to specialize in pelvic health physical therapy for um, an org- a company called Herman and Wallace, which is one of the major players in the continuing education of physical therapists in the pelvic health area. Another organization is the APTA, the American Physical Therapy Association. And there are lots of other people who do education, but those I think are the two primary ones in this country that do continuing education for people who want to go into pelvic health. Um, so I know that like Herman and Wallace, they have a, you know, a level one course, which is more of an overview. It's you do urinary stuff. You learn about, I would say two, you know, different layer, different levels teach different topics more in depth. Right. So there's other layer levels that will talk more about colorectal issues or like or pelvic pain is gone into in more detail in higher courses versus like one is more of an introduction where you get a little bit of a taste of everything and you learn a little bit about everything. Um, and then the more in depth you go into the coursework, the more you learn more specifically treatment and being able to, you know, make the treatment plans, being able to understand what your exam is and how you do an exam, you know, what you're looking at, what you're finding and how that correlates to how you're going to be treating that patient from a physical therapy perspective. Is there like a a formal 
certification or board certification for people who do pelvic health or it's just people who have been trained and do it and practice in it? Yeah, they do both ways. I mean, you can definitely practice as a pelvic health physical therapist without being board certified, but there are different certifications from different organizations. The APTA has a certification, Herman and Wallace has their PRPC, and different organizations provide their own opportunity to add lots of letters to that to the to the end of your name. Right. You should take their exam. Right. So desire, you know, and there are plenty of people who, you know, just have lots of experience and practice pelvic health physical therapy as well. So right. yes, there, yes, there is. You can get lots of letters, lots of alphabet letters, as many as you want in our field, actually, just tons of them. Are there any people that you know of who do a lot of pelvic health who are not physical therapists? Like they come at it from a different original training? Like dentists, like you said, for example? Yeah. For dentists, no. So far as I know, dentists are not really treating pelvic right. floor physical therapy. So far as I know, not yet. I do. Although there is, I do find that sometimes when I ask patients about pelvic pain, there is some correlation between that and TMJ, oh. like where people are holding their attention. Oftentimes, I'll ask patients who have pelvic pain, you know, do you have TMJ? And so many times they'll tell me yes. We should do a study on that sometime. Anyway, but yes, Herman and Walsh, the APTA will only teach physical therapists, licensed physical therapists, mm -hmm. versus a, a company like Herman and Wallace will also, if you're, if you have a license to touch, so if you are a nurse practitioner, if you are an OT, that's become very big now, occupational oh, therapists have started sense. doing... Okay. I've started doing pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, I'm sure there's some PAs. I've taught PAs in my, I've had PAs in my course. I've had, I'm trying to think who else, nurse practitioners, OTs. Basically, if you have, if you have license to touch, then you can come to one of their courses. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. You do actually do in court, in the course or part of our, part of our education is pelvic, well, part of our, health, our education is physical therapists in general, unlike medical students where, from what my understanding is that like they hire models when you practice doing pelvic exams in medical school. But in physical therapy school, you actually, um, your lab partners, you know, whether it's just regular orthopedic or cardiopulmonary, you in lab, or at least it was how I went to school, is that you worked on each other. When you're the therapist and then you're the patient, which is nice in that you have the opportunity to understand what it feels like and the vulnerability of being a patient and what that experience is like. And in pelvic health, it's the same. Whoa, that when seriously? you go to one of these courses, yes, yeah, seriously. Little known facts about your pelvic health physical therapist. What, what, are the, what, are the, what do the men do? When you, that's a good, well, you know what? Now, actually, it used to be in the olden days that they required men to bring with um, a model or a partner to come with to be their partner. And now it's very much that men are are welcome and people of all genders yeah. are welcome. You, you can choose your lab partner and who you'd feel comfortable working with and you're encouraged to switch partners because everybody's anatomy is a little different. And, you know, being, you know, which is really, really interesting because you really learn about what a 65-year-old woman, how her anatomy might be different or her body might might respond differently to exam versus a 22-year-old woman who's never had children. And so you actually, when you go to these continuing education courses, at least from the ones that I teach, is that in lab, you are both the therapist and the patient, and you um, get to experience it from both sides of it. So that's really a, an interesting part of our education as well. Wow, I did not know that at all. That is really interesting. Yeah, when I was in med school, we first practiced on each other for things like drawing blood and IVs, just because like, <laughs> right. you know, you know like, like you poke me, I'll poke you. It's like, we'll, we'll all suffer together. When we, do, when we did abdominal exams, we did them on each other. And technically the abdominal exam includes completely undressing and dressing like below the waist, you know, as well, part of the exam. So I remember we did... We had that, but we didn't do pelvic exams on each other or rectal exams on each other, uh, not in med school. Yeah, so physical therapists don't really do, we don't call it like a pelvic exam because right. that implies like there's a speculum involved. And in this country anyway, physical therapists, pelvic health physical therapists don't use a speculum. So it's all manual, um, like a digital exam by using a gloved hand while lubricated, hopefully, um, to be able to do- Hopefully really gloves, hopefully lubricated. Yeah, Both. please. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> if you don't, you just keep walking. Yeah. But, and, and you're really looking at the muscles. You're really looking at just as if somebody came into physical therapy, a regular physical therapy practice with right. a shoulder problem or an elbow problem. And they say, okay, and I want you to raise your arm over your head. And I want you to, you know, extend your elbow. And I'm to resist your anyone who's gone to physical therapy for any kind of you know orthopedic issue and really pelvic health physical therapy really is like orthopedics of the pelvis and that you know people don't realize it's, i always say people think their vaginas like are existing in outer space like there's their there's their body and then there's their vagina like somewhere else and they always see this made of the same stuff muscles and nerves and ligaments and bone and it responds very similarly in terms of you know range of motion how you know can you 
Can you contract? Can you relax? Can you push down? What does that look like when you do that? And how that correlates with whatever problem they're coming in for. Is it, does it hurt here? How about here? How about here? Does this hurt? Being able to kind of find points that are painful, just as if you came in with like a shoulder impingement or a, a you know, a tendonitis in, you know, somewhere that you're really looking at the nerves and muscles, how they're functioning, how they're not functioning, and putting that back in the context of the body overall. Like I'm also looking at posture. I'm not forgetting I'm a physical therapist. I look at how are they holding their pelvis in relation to their rib cage, in relation to their breathing, in relation to their shoulders, because that could really impact um, and, and really help me figure out what the problem is and why they're having this problem. Absolutely. I, I'm going to, I want to ask you about all the specific problems you treat, but I have to digress for one second because it just struck me that I was thinking, if 40 years ago, our teachers at Yeshiva Day School would have heard us talking about this, they would have thrown <laughs> us both out of school. And if they we would have predicted that, you know, Rifki, they Rifki, you, if Rifki and Nadia, well, yeah, I guess they would have predicted that if Rifki and Nadia, we have this conversation later in life, they also would have thrown us out of school. So, you know, look how far we've come. Unbelievable. I, you know what, I was thinking the same thing, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, back to the topic. Tell me about some of the things that you treat. Like, what are the most common conditions that women will come to you for in regards to pelvic health? Most common, and whether this is the most prevalent pelvic floor issue, or it's just the one that drives people to want to get to some lady's office and have her look at their pelvic floor um, or not, is pelvic pain, for sure. Number one is that women, um, by the way, there is pelvic health physical therapy for men. So just to put that out there, men do get pelvic pain and do have pelvic floor issues, but we'll be talking about women. So in terms of women, if they're having, if they're having pain, if they're having pain with um, intercourse, if they're having, um, or they're having difficulty, like they, they can't go to the gynecologist because they're afraid of exam because it hurts so much, mm-hmm. they will, it's interfering in their life in that way, then they will be coming to see me or they're just having constant pelvic pain, just pain in that region. That is for sure the number one, I think I I think I've spent most of my day treating. Is that mostly younger women or older women or both? It's a good question. Thank you. I, I see I see a lot of younger women, primarily um, women who are finding out for the first time that they're having trouble having intercourse. Mm-hmm. But you, it can happen at any stage in life. And you have women who maybe had no pain at all. They're having pain-free intercourse, no problems in the area at all. And then they had a delivery. Um, they had either, they had a lot of tearing, they have a scar in the area from, from uh, something that went on during the delivery and they have a lot, a lot of stitches and that area becomes very, very tender and painful. So I could see them for that. And also women, menopausal, perimenopausal, when there's, you know, change in hormones, women who've never had any pain with sex or never pay, had any pain in that area, all of a sudden they're, you know, it just doesn't feel like it used to, and they're feeling a lot of pain and discomfort. And in those women, it's really so troubling for them because it's like, I never had any problems in my whole life. Like what happened? Why right. am I having all these problems? And women post cancer treatments, um, I'll see women who have had chemo radiation for different cancers come in and due to the changes in the tissue uh, now are having horrible pain and they want in part they want to get back to their lives and physical therapy can be so helpful for those women as well so it really could be all different stages of life and all for all different kinds of reasons in terms of the pelvic pain so I was, we'll focus on that first are the treatments the same for all the groups you mentioned, you know, the, the woman who's for the first time having, you know, sex and it's painful or for someone maybe after a delivery or someone later in life, are, are your modalities and treatments the same or are they very different based on the, the cause of that type of pain? Well, I would say that the treatment plan can be different, like how I would go about looking at them. But what I end up doing oftentimes is the same. First, you want to look, take a look and figure out, you know, is something going on orthopedic that's going on? Is there some back pain? Is there something else that's going on that's contributing to this pain? And you want to kind of root all that out first. And also the modalities that we use are also very similar in terms of what we're using in physical therapy for any kind of painful area. You know, you're using manual techniques, um, using therapeutic exercise, depending on what the problem is. Like, you know, we always say in physical therapy, you find what you treat. So I'm not like curing anybody's vulvodynia. I'm not right. curing anybody's, you know, you know, results of radiation to their skin. But what I can do is help them change the way their body responds and also change the way that they're experiencing their symptoms so that, you know, the tissue isn't as painful anymore. Uh, they're able to tolerate sex or maybe perhaps even enjoy sex for the first time because they're not having this kind of pain anymore. 
So yeah, oftentimes, you know, what I'm doing, I guess if you are somebody who I always say the physical therapy is, you know, in general, is like kind of a boring thing to watch, but it probably would look, if you were just watching me, it would probably look a lot like the same stuff mm -hmm. in terms of where I'm going and what, where I'm treating or the techniques I'm using, those can be different because you're really looking at what, you know, which muscle group is giving them the problems. Why are they having this problem? Like, for example, a woman who is having let's say a woman who's having a hard time, she's just, you know, she's just started having sex. She's just starting vaginal um, penetration and she's having a really hard time. And every time, every time her partner tries to insert his penis, she starts screaming and she's agonizing in pain and they can't have intercourse. And this is very troublesome for them both. You know, that is a very different picture because you have to kind of look at, you know, it's, it's almost like they're in a fight or flight because they've had this experience of something being so, so painful over and over and over again. So it's almost like the pain has kind of tangled itself over on itself because they've had so many experiences of being painful as opposed, even, as opposed to somebody who's maybe had an experience of sex never being painful in their life and all of a sudden it's being painful. So you have a lot more to untangle with somebody who kind of has this like in this fight or flight mode uh, about sex and you kind of have to really go at it from a different perspective and having them sometimes they're lacking education about their own body they're scared of what's going on down there they're afraid that they're going to break they're afraid their vagina is going to break they're afraid they're going to be split open um, it feels like that that's what's happening so kind of helping them down regulate their nervous system you know starting with deep breathing helping them become educated about their own anatomy, you know, women across the educational, socioeconomic, cultural gamut really oftentimes do not know their own anatomy. They've never seen their own pelvic floor in a mirror. They don't know where anything is and they're afraid to touch their own body as if like it's a different, you know, they're afraid something's going to happen. So being able to educate them and give them the tools to be able to own their own anatomy and not be afraid of it could be something that's really really valuable versus a six-year-old woman who's like yeah honey i had six kids i know what's going on down there <laughs> so that's very different experience so in terms of you know what that treatment session looks like um right now in terms of the the scenario you described with the young couple you know having a difficult time how effective is what you do meaning should they is it something that takes a couple of sessions? Is it something that take a couple of years, like in between? What What do you typically find in that circumstance? And the second question I'm going to ask you is, how do they find you? Is it their gynecologist sends them to you? Is it a family or friend who sends them to you? Like, what is, what is the way that they would find you that you even exist? In terms of how they find us, oftentimes it's their physician. Oftentimes it's word of mouth. It's patients. Patients, you know people, you know, I always say it's, it's, it's horrible that people suffer in pain and they don't realize so many other women have had this problem. And when they've spoken to like a friend or someone else, or, you know, reached out to somebody for help and they're like, oh yeah, you know, my sister had that, or, you know, my friend had that. And they went to a public health physical therapist and it was great. And I think in the media, the awareness has just increased about public health physical therapy and pelvic pain, which has been wonderful opening the conversation. Like this is, you are, you are not ignore it, Well, it's not something some somebody wants. It's so much more common than women know and realize. They think that nobody has this problem. They think they're broken. They think their vagina is broken. They think that nobody in the world else is having this problem. And from my, from the way I see it, like the whole world is pelvic pain. Right. Everybody comes to my office with pelvic pain. It's like somebody, you don't, you have sex without pain. That's like a miracle. Right. <laughs> but um, because that's all I see all day. But, but for them, they think they're really the only person. So yes, yeah, so they could be, it could be word of mouth through friends. It could be through doctors. It could be through it could be through mental health professionals who are becoming, you know, more aware of the importance of our fields. So any of the above. And what, what was your other question? How, how, I know I know, I was going to remember both questions. Well, I mean, you know, we, we are from the 1900s, so we are to be, <laughs> we are to be forgiven. But I'm going to get back to my first question. But I think that what you mentioned is so important because a lot of people, not only do they think that they're the only person who this happens to or the only couple it happens to ever, they want to look at it. They then somehow think that they have a mental health problem because of it, you know, that somehow because of this, they therefore have an anxiety disorder or they're somehow, you know, not attracted to men or whatever it might be. And right, or they don't that, like their, they don't right, like their, they don't like their husbands, well, which might be true, right. might not be true. I mean, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's not, it, it doesn't work like that. Like a lot of people there, they have everything, you know, they, they have desire and they love their husband. They want to be it's with him and, and yeah, everything is wonderful. It's just, it's physical, purely a physical response that they have and it builds on itself. And so they're made to think that not only is there something wrong with them, but now it's not just their body, it's their mental health. And it's it, it could be none of that, obviously. 
So I, I just think it's so important what you're saying that it's so common and it's treatable. And that was my question, my forgetful friend, is um, how- <laughs> You can edit that part out. <laughs> how, I already forgot your name, so forget about it. How, yeah, it's all good. How effective are the treatments that you use in terms of, should someone who comes to you for this sort of like expect that it's going to work? And in what kind of time frame is typical? And obviously there's a range, but sort of what should they expect? Yeah. So I always, people, I always say people call on the phone and they always ask, you know, three questions, you know, do you take insurance? How much do you charge? And how long is this going to take to fix? So in terms of how does it take to fix? Like a car. It's always, (laughs) always that question. Um, But I don't, I understand, like, I get it. Um, So I always tell people that I don't really, you know, I don't have a crystal ball so much, but that my, what I've really learned over the years is that the longer the problem has been going on for the longer they've been struggling with this the longer it takes to kind of unravel that makes sense it's almost a mirror yeah when people come in early on and you know sometimes i'm you know i'm of the thought like people are just getting you know too much therapy is too much therapy like everything needs therapy but sometimes getting in early really not sometimes i really believe at this point in my career that getting in early with the problem with pelvic pain is saves people years of aggravation because if it hasn't had a chance to really become like a whole pain cycle then it it really it's so much easier for them to be able to work through it oftentimes i'm not saying always but in my experience of that kind of particular scenario the less time that this has been going on for the much shorter time usually the treatment takes when this has been going on and I, I don't see it as much anymore because I think the awareness has increased both in the medical professionals and the mental health professionals and, you know, all kinds of, you know, in the religious communities with the with the um, bride teachers and all that, that they are coming for help sooner. And I, in the beginning of my profession, I've seen people who are kind of like going three years suffering wow. with all these kinds of conditions or having difficulty with intercourse for three years or whatever it was, never having anybody say, Hey, you know, there's help. There's somebody who can help you with this. You shouldn't have to suffer like this. Yeah. Yeah. And and when people have been going through a really long time with having this kind of pain, it does take longer, I think, for it to resolve. Um, And in terms of how effective it is, I think people do really well. Um, I think that it's really important for it to be a team approach. You know, I'm married to a gynecologist and I, I don't think that physical therapy cures everything. I think that there is really an important role in making sure that there's not something else, God forbid, going on right. with this patient that is not something a physical therapist treat. Every patient that I see, I want them to be checked out by a gynecologist. I want to make sure that there's nothing that's beyond the scope of physical therapy that needs to be treated, you know, an infection or something else. And once all that is cleared, then I, then I want them to come to me and I want them to, you know, come to sessions regularly. I want them to go home and do their exercises. Just like if you have an, if you have a tennis injury and you go for physical therapy, they're going to give you a home exercise program. Right. And, you know, while the physical therapy could be beneficial without you doing a home exercise program, you know, when they do, when patients do do their exercises and come to therapy sessions regularly, they do really well. Cause there is some patient ownership in this, you know, unlike medicine, um, which is, um, is more like you are, you know, the doctor does something to, you know, you're like, you're, you have a headache and you take two Tylenol and it goes away. Right. So for physical therapy, it's really much more of a partnership in that the patient, uh, needs to come to the table and do their part and their part of the exercises or the work at home for the days that they're not in the treatment room, because there's just so much that can get done. I always say people, patients say, I'm like, I don't know if I should come. I need to do my exercises. Like, do you send your kids to school? Even if they didn't do their homework? Like I send my kids to school. Like, you, you, like so they're going to school anyway. Will they get much more out of the lesson if they did their homework the night before? Yeah. But can they really get something out of school? Uh, you know, even if they didn't do their homework back in the day when kids went to school, then yes. So right. it is It is a very active patient and, it, and it's empowering for patients when they don't just feel like they're laying there on the table and somebody is just doing something to them, but that there's something that they're being educated in ways that they can help themselves and help their own pain. That's empowering and they don't feel victim to their own pain anymore. They understand A, why this is happening. And a good public health physical therapist will do a good amount of patient education, explaining to them their anatomy, explaining to them why they're having this difficulty, and then empowering them to help them help themselves but, you know, with certain treatments that they tell them to do at home or for modifications in their lifestyle that they're suggesting and taking ownership like that is hugely empowering. And that in itself is makes patients feel so much better leaving, leaving the office, even after the first visit. Right. And when you say in your office, just to, to clarify, I mean, I understood it, but in case anyone didn't, when you say they come to you for therapy, that is 
physical therapy. You're touching them. Physical this is, this is not, Absolutely. they're not on the couch telling, talking to them no, about your, about no, their no, childhood. No. This is your, your, your hands on. You guys are yes, moving and yes, you know, yes. doing They're getting yeah. undressed. Yes. Okay. They're getting undressed. Yes. And I only see one patient at a time. I always tell people like, it's not like a gym, you know, everybody walking around. You know? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I see one, I see one patient at a time and it's a private room. Right. And there is talking that goes on because I think it, there is, uh, I'm not a mental health professional, but there is, um, but yeah, you have you a know, relationship. To your patient. You want to know what your patient is, you know, to tell you, they always say like the, the best, if you listen to your, really listen to your patient, that they'll tell you exactly what's wrong. And I think that but just by listening to a patient's story, I oftentimes know exactly what it is that's going on. And I'm usually right. The exam just confirms what I already know from listening. Like, I'm sure, you know, at this point in your career too, you know exactly what's going on before you even do the exam because it's, you've heard it so many times before. Usually. Okay. So, so after pelvic pain, which is again, its own fascinating topic and prevalent. What what are some of the other things that you treat yeah, a lot of? Urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence. Uh, urinary yeah. incontinence. Stress incontinence, frequency and urgency. Um, I treat a lot of that. Right. And a lot of that is, I mean, we had, we had, a, we had a podcast about urinary incontinence and- It was it great. Was, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That's right. You listened. So, so great. So, so, so we're talking about, you know, how we refers, uh, this doctor, Dr. Garrell, refers a lot for pelvic floor therapy. And there it's really about sort of strengthening the muscles, right? It's not because of pain, but it's sort of this idea that if you can strengthen the pelvic floor, you can lower the the incontinence, e- either to the mm-hmm. point that they're cured or to the point that they can live with it or just improve it, whichever. Yeah. And it's, it's you know, it's kind of a little bit of a misnomer because if it was just the floor that needed to be strengthened, um, then doing a thousand kegels a day would really make everybody in this country continent. But we mm-hmm. know by the amount of incontinence products that they sell and the mm-hmm. billion dollar industry that is, that that's not the case. Um, and there are two things that play here. One is that there was a study done recently that showed that of the women who did or reported to be doing Kegels, when I say Kegels, it's an exercise of tight, for people who don't know, it's tightening your vaginal muscles or your pelvic floor muscles, like as if you're holding back urine, that kind of sensation. That of the women who said, when they said that they did Kegels, and then they actually had somebody trained watch them do it that there was a very high percentage of women who were not doing the right thing. Right. And that's for so, good to biofeedback, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. And also that women don't really know. Um, there's also particularly women who have had like trauma to the area by via delivery or surgery. They may also just not even know where those muscles are anymore. And they have a really hard time just tapping into those muscles to getting them to tighten, or they just don't know what they're doing or they're substituting with other muscles. Um, like they're tightening their inner thigh or they're tightening their, their, you know, their, their rectum. So, right. So you want to make sure that they're tightening the right muscle. And yeah, so you said biofeedback and biofeedback is a great way to kind of mirror what the muscles are doing. So the patients can see on the screen, a representation of what their muscle, it doesn't hurt, but watching what those muscles are doing on a screen, kind of like an EKG shows you what your heart, you know, your heart is not a voluntary muscle, but you can watch your heart beat, you know, go up and down and up and down. When you tighten the muscle, any muscle of the body can do biofeedback on you watch it tighten and relax. You can see whether you actually in fact are tightening it and relaxing it like you think you are. So, but you know, you could teach patients that in lots of different ways, right. not just biofeedback, lots of ways, but also, you know, is that it's not in, in, in the doctor you spoke with also spoke about um, this, about the pressure system in the body in terms of the, and the role that plays in incontinence. And what we know is that it's not just the floor that's important, but the whole pelvic girdle and all the muscles that support it, both in the front and on the sides and in the back, not just the bottom, which is the, what we typically think of as the pelvic floor. And when women have instability or weakness in those other muscles, it, it has a really hard time keeping keeping urine inside or having stability enough to keep supporting the organs the way they need to be. Like if you think about a tree, and this is kind of a basic example, but if you think about a, a hammock hanging between two trees, and if the tree and like there's a nice tarp, you know, or a nice canvas that you're ordered from Wayfair or something, uh, hanging between the trees, you got the rope that's hanging it, and then you've got the trees. So if the trees are like wobbly and and you know old and wilt, they're not strong. But the but this but the hammock is really strong and the ropes are really strong. It doesn't matter because if you sit down, it's going to collapse. And if any part of that system, no matter how strong the canvases or how strong the trees are, if all the components of that system are not strong and doing their job the way they should be, you're not going to have a, a system that's working or supporting you the way you need it to be. So a lot of women, particularly women who've had babies or surgeries, they have weakness in other muscle groups, you know, we like to call it the core muscles, but it could be all the muscles that supported, you know, gluteus medius, transverse abdominis, 
multifidus in the back, you know, all of those muscles together, um, a few others, they come together to kind of support the whole pelvic girdle, like we, we call it. So when you look at a patient and you want to know why are they having incontinence, why are they leaking, you're also looking at that whole system. Like how is that, what's their alignment like? Or how are they standing? Are they holding their body in a way that's even allowing them to, uh, to be able to withstand the pressure of a sneeze or a cough? or even allow those muscles to work in their best range of motion, just like any muscle, like your bicep, like there's a certain range. If you go, you know, go to the gym and have a trainer teach you how to, you know, strengthen your bicep, you know, there's a certain angle that, that your bicep is the most powerful. We know that the pelvic floor and the pelvic girdle muscles, that they need to be, they function best in certain alignments. Um, and people who are standing in kind of like a, the way women stand after they have baby are pregnant, <laughs> they continue to stand like that till they're 80 years old until somebody tells their body they're not pregnant anymore is really a hard way for those muscles to work. They're just not in a great position for, for activating in that position. Wow. That hammock, uh, sort of analogy was awesome, by the way, just so you know, that really with it the trees. Mine. I, I don't know who thought of it, but it's, it's a good one. No, that is definitely, uh, that's a really, cause I, I mean, that's frequently what I'll, I'll use in terms of explaining what the pelvic floor is, but I never went out to the trees. And I think that that's a great, you know, that's trees. a great point. Well, <laughs> we're almost the trees. All right. So you see what, so just explain just so women know what we're talking about. How does biofeedback work sort of logistically? What are they, what, what happens? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So it doesn't hurt. That's the most important thing I think for people to know. And also pelvic floor physical therapy should not hurt. Right. I always tell people that, like, you know, I can't vouch for every pelvic health physical therapy out there, therapist out there, but I always tell patients there's one rule in my office and that is there's no pain. So I really don't believe that causing people pain um, is going to make anything better. They could be like uncomfortable. It could be like not their favorite activity in the world to do, but um, it really should not be pa a painful experience. Um, so biofeedback does not hurt. Basically what it is, is is either you can have it um, with small electrodes that are like sticky kind of like surgical grade adhesive, like they're not getting any waxing job from this mm -hmm. or anything. It goes on the pelvic floor muscle from the outside. It actually goes um, outside the anal sphincter because they found that to be the best placement to get to pick up the pelvic floor muscles in general from there. So they'll put one on e the placement is one on either side of the anal sphincter, or sometimes the physical therapists will use an internal probe, which looks like like an ultrasound. Okay, yeah, like an ultrasound, but it's smaller. Yeah but they have to be able to tolerate that. And they'll right. put that, that, by the way, these are all disposable or the one that goes internal is, you know, just one per patient. It's not used from one patient to the next. Um, that sensor goes internally, inserts like a tampon. And then there's a wire from that that hooks up to, to a box that, you know, they can either have a, a display that's like a computer display. We have fancy programs, which makes like a, a rose opening and closing. I actually had a patient who once <laughs> bought, baked me a cake in the shape of a, a honey cake, no less. <laughs> and the shape of a cake, if you're listening, I love you. Um, <laughs> in the shape of a cake, uh, a rose. And I had done biofeedback with her with the rose opening and closing. Obviously, when you, the tighter you close your muscles, you squeeze them, then the rose closes. And when you relax it, the rose opens. And she baked me this cake. And, and when she finished therapy and she wrote me a note that said, thank you for teaching me to open and close my rose so beautifully. <laughs> And I had it on my table and my brother-in-law came over and I explained the significance of the cake and he literally like spit out the cake. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> I'm not eating this. Yeah. yeah, I'm not eating this. But it was really sweet. So bake your physical therapist cakes. They really appreciate it. Anyway, so, um, so right. So they have, you know, these programs which are fancy, um, you know, launch, launching of rocket ships, which would give you the visual. Or it could just be a simple bar, like, you know, right. those smaller devices where it's literally just a box where it's like like old school Atari, you know, like the, the bar goes up and the bar goes down and you tighten your muscles and the bar goes up and you relax your muscles and the bar goes down. And that helps you realize, you know, whether you're really tightening them or not. And, and conversely, I sometimes do it with my pelvic pain patients because they don't realize that they are holding the stress of their entire lives in their pelvic floor. And I say to them, okay, now I want you to take some nice deep breaths and I want you to visualize. Oh, and you see relax in the opposite muscles. direction. Yeah, exactly. So you can, what we call that, we call that down training. So if we're right. trying to get somebody to let go of their let pelvic them, floor You're muscles, trying to get them to open the rows. Open the rows, exactly. I <laughs> got it. Rows. Versus if we're trying to strengthen, then right. we're trying to, what we call, right. um, you know, we're trying to uh, to get them to tighten their muscles. So right. that, that, but you can have, you can have muscles that are both weak and tight also. So just because someone is having tight, you know, pain in their pelvic floor, it doesn't mean that they have a strong pelvic floor. Sometimes right. it can, you know, it, it could be both. Wow. So interesting. And what about things like in pregnancy, 
the various pains that women have either, mm. you know, whether it's in their, in their sacrum or whether it's just their yeah. pelvic floor, you know, their, their pelvis shifting, or I assume you see a lot of pubic symphysis pain. Yeah. Yeah. So what, yes. how do you, how do, how do you work with women first during pregnancy potentially, and then after delivery? Cause I assume you see a, a fair number of women with those. It really depends on what is going on and why, why they're having this pain. Um, you know, is there something orthopedic? Sometimes it's interesting is women will have like, a, like a pre-existing orthopedic issue, you know, but doesn't bother them that much or maybe they're not even aware of it and then you put the strain of like a fetus growing in them to just throw it all out of whack like they have an old injury or something and then everything gets thrown out of whack because the a the ligamentous laxity that occurs with pregnancy um also their center of gravity being shifted forward um you know all the venous changes that happen really getting to the root of why because like you know 10 different women can have 10 different reasons for why they're having pain and where their pain is in pregnancy if it's an si joint pain problem um or where where that where that's coming from. So sometimes, you know, it will be working on stabilizing, helping them. You can you can get stronger while you're pregnant. There, you know, as long as your doctor says it's okay for you to be doing exercise, and I usually really like communicating with doctors during pregnancy, particularly to make sure that they're down for whatever it is that I am envisioning will help the patient and that it's safe for them. And you know, we'll work on strengthening other muscles or even their core muscles during yeah. pregnancy so that it better supports them so that they're not just hanging with all that weight, pulling them forward and putting all the stress on the joints, but strengthening other parts of the body to help them support themselves. And they really feel so much better um, when we can kind of give them something else you know, something else to help hold them up. So it could be strengthening, it could be helping them with, you know, alignment in terms of how they're, or body mechanics, how they're getting out of bed. I get this a lot. Women have so much pain. They feel like their hips are falling off when they get out of bed in the morning. So we're problem solving what muscles they're using, what muscles they're not using, what position they're using to get out of bed in the morning. Um, and all those things to kind of help them recruit muscles that are working for them better uh, in a way that will keep, you know, the pain at bay or help them feel more comfortable and more supported during pregnancy. Yeah. And I mean, generally, most of the times or almost all of the time, we, the obstetricians are going to be totally in favor of these exercises. And, you know, it's, it's almost never that the physical therapist is to say, I want to do A, B, and C. And I'm going to say, oh, no, you can't do that. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it almost never happens. And if, if it is, it's only because it's a physical therapist who's never worked with a pregnant woman. And it's, it's like a <laughs> unique situation, but basically that it, they're right. basically all fine. Do you find in your own practice when pregnant women come to you with these types of pains, it is helpful if they've been evaluated already saying, all right, the pain is because of this, or they had an MRI or this, whatever it is, or is it sort of like, you know, you see these, you can figure it out, you can treat them. How does, how does that work? Uh, you're saying, do I need to have imaging done to know not, what's wrong? Not there? necessarily imaging. For example, there are, you know, sometimes women will first see a physician, like, you know, an orthopedist mm -hmm. or a, you know, a rehab specialist or someone who does this and they mm -hmm. sort of do an evaluation, an exam, maybe imaging, maybe not. And then they say, okay, you need physical therapy on this region in this way. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to send you to physical therapist with a prescription. So that's one way someone's going to come to you versus someone just walks in your door and says, I'm pregnant and like my hips hurt. Does right. it matter to you in a sense, or you pretty much are going to treat them the no, same way either way? I'm going to treat them the same. I mean, unless there's something really concerning to me, like a red flag that mm -hmm. says, you know, this really needs further testing because I'm concerned about, you know, this symptom seems something that is, in my, you know, a red flag that needs to be checked out by a specialist, as long as it's within the realm of, you know, musculoskeletal. But the exams that physical therapists do are not medical exams. They're, they're musculoskeletal evaluation. So mm -hmm. I'm looking at their muscles, their nerves. I'm looking at, you know, what's going on with, you know, different forces in their body and how things are pulling on, on their bones and ligaments. And then I'm looking at, you know, what is causing this discomfort and what can we do to help them, you know, be stronger or use their body differently. Sometimes the body, the, the way that the way that they're using their body is causing the pain. Their body mechanics needs to be altered. The way they're sitting at their desk for 12 hours is really putting a real strain on them. It's, it's fascinating to find out, you know, how people live in their bodies and what they're doing in the course of the day really impacts them and impacts the way that they're feeling. So if we could tweak the way that they're, you know, getting out of bed or standing and washing dishes or tending to their children or riding the subway, whatever it is, we could problem solve and figure out what we call like finding the driver. What is, what is causing problem? And yeah, and it's a physical therapy diagnosis. Right. It's not a medical diagnosis and it doesn't really, you know, I'll, we always say treat what you find. You look at patients telling you they have pain in their left hip every time they pick up their toddler. 
So then that's what we're treating. We want your left hip to not hurt you. And we want you to be able to pick up your toddler and for as long as you can without it hurting you. And what can we do to make that possible for you? Right. You must be so busy because just the three things you mentioned, you know, pelvic pain, incontinence, and then pregnancy related pains, ooh, like 98% of women have that over the course of their life. I mean, it's just, yeah. these things are so common. I mean, you must have a line out the door unless you think women really aren't seeking treatment for these things. You know, I think that it's amazing that there's an awareness and that women know that there's help. I mean, it used to be in the olden days, you come to the doctor with pain and they would tell you, yeah, it's pregnancy. You know, like there's such an improved awareness that there's other, like have the baby, you'll feel better. But I think that there's such an improved awareness that there's something that we can give women to do. Try this, try, you know, and maybe it won't help, you know, maybe really the only thing that's going to make them feel better is actually to deliver that right. nine right, but try. that's been sitting on their sacrum for six months, you know, but really that there's something to offer them to try is really helpful. And it's hopeful for women because it can really help them. And I would say also that women who are thinking about getting pregnant, being in good shape. And I see this both with urinary incontinence and in pregnancy patients is that women who are in good shape, who exercise regularly, who take care of their health um, and are physically active, really do much better in physical therapy. Not that a woman who has never exercised day in her life can't do well in physical therapy, but oftentimes they'll get much better outcomes faster as well if they've had a general baseline of really being in shape. Um, in some ways, these patients are the most devastated when things go wrong. They're like, I've been at the gym every day for like six hours my whole life. I can't believe this is happening to my body now. It's like they feel like, you know, yeah. betrayed by their body. But um, We're all betrayed but, by our bodies. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm very upset at my body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but really, if a woman knows that she's going to plan on getting pregnant, you know, being in good shape and being um, active and throughout pregnancies, as long as the doctor says it's, it's helpful, you know, being being physically active throughout pregnancy is a game changer for women. Yeah. It could really prevent a lot of a lot of these problems or really help treatment move along faster. If I there's totally a general agree. muscle tone. Yeah. I mean, I, I believe that so strongly. And obviously you can have someone who's in perfect shape and has, you know, terrible pain. It's not like a for sure going to prevent things. And it doesn't mean if someone has pain, it's their fault, obviously. But oh, obviously the, idea, not, the obviously idea that not. the idea of walking into pregnancy or anything through life, you know, physically fit and good shape, your, your body's used to these things, you know, strength and mobility and cardiovascular. If you have those, your likelihood of having an easier pregnancy is so much higher and an easier recovery is so much higher. And it's just, it can't be stressed how important that is. And people always, you know, focus on the baby, like what am I eating for the baby and this, and they just forget about their own general health. And that's usually going to be the best thing for them. And it turns out for the baby too. It's obviously. so true. Yeah. It's so true. And patients will say, people will say to me, like, if I do this, well, like, well, well, will my delivery go better? And I'm like, you know what? All bets are off what's going to happen with your delivery. <laughs> but probably but I, people are in better know, shape, do better at delivery and they recover better. There's no question. But like you said, yeah, going into something, you know, we've no idea, you know, what how necessarily people could be in the best shape of their lives and have problems and pain and pa patients can, you know, they certainly shouldn't be blaming themselves if something is going wrong. But this most important thing knows that there's something that can be done and they shouldn't just have to feel like hopeless that this is just my fate in life. This is what happened to my grandmother and this is what happened to my mother and this is how it's going to be for me now because this is what happens. That, you know, there's, you can, you can get help for yourself. You can go for physical therapy and you can have an improvement in your life, whether it's pain with intercourse or pain with wearing a tampon or going to, or being able to tolerate a gynecological exam or if you're leaking urine or having pain in your pregnancy. All these things um, are oftentimes really treatable with physical therapy and could do really, people do really, really well. Yeah. I was going to ask you a question. If you had to pick one condition that women have that, they don't realize is treatable, but when they come to you, it is. Meaning, what is the thing that women just don't even realize? Oh my God, I have this, but it can't be treated. That they're sort of uh, that they sort of resign themselves to living with when they don't need to. That's a good question. I think the I think the pelvic pain. I think some women just think. I think for the urinary incontinence. If they're coming to me ready for urinary incontinence, they already really think that like right. that I have something to offer them. Right. <laughs> you know, and I hope that you know, and and they do do they do well most of the time. Um, as the doctor just spoke about, there are some cases that absolutely there's a limitation to physical therapy. Sometimes structurally things need to be fixed uh, in other ways. Um, there is limitations, but women could do really well. I think with the pelvic pain, I think women who are having pain with intercourse or pelvic pain, they think that there's just sort of like, a, they feel like this is just going to be my life forever. I'm just going to have to suck it up. And if I want to have penetrative sex, that I'm just going to have to live like this and just grin and bear it or scream or 
figure something else out because this is just, I, this is never going to get any better. I can't even imagine that this is going to help. And women who say to me, you know, I don't, you know, I'd ask them about orgasm. Like, do you have arousal? Do you have, you know, any enjoyment? Not necessarily with intercourse, but, you know, with any sexual activity. And oftentimes women will tell me they don't. And that it's, you know, and I, and I say to them, well, if you're having this kind of 10 out of 10 pain, then, or you're anticipating that you're going to have, pen- this is going to lead to penetration, which is going to be a 10 out of 10 pain. Then of course you're not having arousal with foreplay or anything else because you're just waiting. <laughs> you're just right. waiting for that awfulness at the end, you know? if it's going to end with vaginal penetration. So of course you're not going to have an an orgasm because nobody, you know, nobody's, if you're in fight or flight, your body is very hard for you to be able to, you know, be in the rest and digest or enjoyment part of life. So women realizing that once they step out of the pain, that they can more fully embrace their relationships with both their own body and with their partner, I think is really, uh, they really just can't believe it, that they're able to do it. And, and they're just, it changes everything for them. Is that the best part of what you do? I was going to ask you, what's the best yes, part of your job? You yeah. Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. I, you know, I really, it's really been the most rewarding. I love being help, helping women at all stages. I love being able to women who have been, you know, wearing pads and, you know, now they're not having leakage, all kinds of problems, but absolutely. When women, women could trust their bodies again, or feel connected to their body and feel like they're able to trust that something is not going to hurt when that is their goal. Like, listen, maybe penetrative sex isn't important to them. And then, you know, that's fine. Or, you know, they don't, but in terms of women who that's important for them, it, them being able to have that is, you know, such a wonder, just being able to see the smile on their faces. They're just so, you know, happy that they're able to uh, have sex without pain or, or even go to a gynecologist. They know they need to go to college, like this like cloud over their head. Like, I know I need to go. I need to, I need to go. Mm-hmm. It's so hurt. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. And then they're like, and they send me text messages literally from the waiting room. Like, I'm telling you, I had a pap smear and it didn't hurt. I love you. And I'm like, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Rifki, I'm so glad we caught up. This is awesome. You're what you're doing. What you're doing is amazing. It's really Thank important stuff. Thank you so stuff. much for having me. This is so. This is so wonderful. And I love that you have this podcast and you're giving such wonderful information to women. That and they can listen to this and not be afraid to ask questions. They can get some so much information about topics that are normally would have been taboo. And like you said, our high school teachers never believe that we were talking about it on a on a podcast. But look at us and hope. And I'm sure you're helping so many women by broadening the awareness of all these important topics. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Please send your entire family my love. And, thank uh, you. and I, I, I miss I miss seeing them around the streets of Chicago. <laughs> but, uh, you know, whatever. We'll see them at some point. Thank you so much for having me. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N. Com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.